Welcome to Media Evolution here in Malmö. Welcome those of you who are following us online via the live stream. So, we're in these times of change. We're kind of, we know that there's a tough situation economically that many people working in the built environment sector feel and sense and experience in their lives. We have the climate crisis that we're feeling the effects of in different parts of the world. We have conflicts, other crises, things that we feel we need to respond to and adapt to when it comes to technological change and social change and, and other things. And at the same time, we're, we have the sense that we're on a transition or even a transformation towards something else. As we've realized that the systems that we live and work and find ourselves in are often and many times extractive, unsustainable and unequal. So we need to transform, transition. And I'm sorry for this terrible metaphor. We kind of need to make a new soup. Yes. Um, we know some of the ingredients that need to go in there. We kind of know that we don't want it to taste like the old soup, the one that we're swimming in right now. But we don't really have the recipe of how to put these things together. And maybe there are actually even more ingredients that we don't even know about or missing. So what is the soup that we're going to do together? I feel, I know many of you feel, many very, very smart people, including all of you, obviously, and people like Nick Dunn, who are here to speak to us today, um, also argue and get the, have a sense that we are lacking visions of what this new future, this new soup uh, for us to, um, that we're transitioning into. These visions of something that is different from today, maybe even better, definitely more sustainable, more livable for, for humans and other species on this planet. And the built environment sector feels this very strongly. There are different initiatives, there are innovations, there are legislation and regulation, there are reports after reports, there are people trying to change things. But it's going very, very slowly. And that's an issue, obviously. We have carbon emissions, we have resource use, we also have the fact that the built environment sector is basically building the built environment, the environments of our societies, the infrastructures, the things that are very, very concrete and very, very real. And these things need to change as well somehow. So visions. There's a sense of a lack of visions of where we're headed when it comes to this. And that's what we're here to talk about today. That's why we're, we're gathered as the built environment and rest of society the sector shaping our built environment um, has a need for thinking about where we're, we're headed while also literally keeping the lights on. Although Nick, you might tell us that we should switch them off sometimes. Um, but while doing that, while keeping, keeping the lights on, actually building something new for, for us to live in and work in. That's the topic of our conversation for today. We have Nick Dunn from Lancaster University giving us a lecture on this topic. My name is Reta Hafner. I lead our foresight work here at Media Evolution. Media Evolution is a non-profit, members-owned organization. It's a place. It's a place that fosters professional community, that fosters competence, and fosters foresight and working with the futures, with our futures in a responsible way. We are here also as a part of a project, an initiative that comes very much from the built environment. It's a strategic project of a one of the uh, one of Sweden's strategic innovation programs called Smart Built Environment, and financed by by different actors, and it's called the Futures We Build. That initiative, this initiative, and some cues that we'll get for that today as well is to look into and actually provide some answers on how will and how should 
the built environment and the sector shaping it look like, function and be organized in a future Sweden where our sustainability goals have been achieved. And to answer that question, there are actually some people here, here today, there are also people who are following this um, on the live stream. Four interdisciplinary teams have been selected, who will be over the, the course of this autumn. They're working to create visions um, that will then be used, published, made available, and then also hand-holdingly uh, guiding the sector to transform together. Not giving the whole answer to that massive challenge, it's not all on your shoulders, teams, um, but, but very much being one piece of that missing puzzle or, 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 or way to start drafting the recipe for the soup that we're making. Today, I'm going to be done with the intro soon, then we have a lecture with Nick, um, where after which you will get to ask questions. So jot down your questions and we'll have time for that and, and then we will gather around conversations um, before we move on into our evening lives. Good to know, for those of you who are here physically, in person, there are toilets down the corridor, there are fire exits if things would go wrong over here and outside over there where you came from as well. And please help us collect the cans afterwards. So that's good to know. And what is also good to know um, is that very, very soon we will be hearing from somebody, someone very, very special. Um, our speaker tonight is professor of urban design and executive director of, of a lab called Imagination. And Imagination is a design and architecture research lab at Lancaster University in the UK. And Nick's our speaker's work examines how we think, how we envision, how we understand the futures of people, places, and planet. He is the author of numerous books, including this one, Future Cities, a visual guide that you will find in our Futures Library, starting from this evening. And he's also a founding director of the Darkness, Dark Design Lab that explores the impacts of nocturnal activity on humans and non-humans. That's why we're having the lecture in the evening, right? So please welcome Nick Dunn. Hello. Is that working? Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, hello, everyone. It's a genuine pleasure to be here. Um, I'd first obviously like to thank Martin and the team at Media Evolution uh, for the invitation to talk here to you today. That's great. And also Rita for the generous introduction. So thank you. Um, what I'm going to be talking about this evening is really focusing on how and why envisioning futures of the built environment is not only valuable as a creative process, and I'm sure many of you recognize it as that, but also how we might use it to affect positive change. Within envisioning processes, there are numerous ways of constructing and communicating ideas. And so we'll be looking at the interface of when cities and the notion of the future kind of come together. And in doing so, I'm trying to you know, help and contribute to better understandings of the power and agency of visions for future built environments. You know, I'm trying to provide a framework, if you like, of different ways of looking at the future, perhaps, um, and we'll talk about some of the ways that futures get dominated by particular actors in different ways. And we're going to do that by looking at the history of the future, if that doesn't sound too much of a paradox uh, for the end of a long day, I'm sure. Um, and also thinking about the patterns and trends that are emerging through some of the visions that we've created. Um, by revealing some of those underlying patterns and themes, the idea is to really contribute to how we then create new visions 
And so the question I have really for, for everyone in this room, including myself, are we actually creating anything new? Are we actually producing new visions? Or are we generally converging and maybe even recycling ideas that we've already had? Now, when we're envisioning things, what we're really doing is creating stories. Stories are vital to how we make sense of ourselves, make sense of each other, and our being in the world. And visions for future places are used in all kinds of different ways to do all kinds of different things. So they may once have been the preserve of planners, of kings, generally kings, I'm afraid, back in the days, you'll know, um, occasionally queens. And then, of course, uh, other people moved in with different types of storytelling and things. But this example, you know, this isn't by an architect, it's not by an urban planner, it's not by a games designer. This was created for a fashion house. And this image is taken from a series produced by the artist Ola Kinjafus for the Escape to New Lagos Autumn Winter Collection 2013-14. It's by fashion designer Wale Aliedi. Um, and by projecting the character of a smart, uh, cosmopolitan man, uh, who's Kiri Jones, you can see in the foreground there. Um, the label tries to develop this kind of founding myth as part of six illustrated stories that examine present-day African society and its future. So it's interesting where these ideas come from, how they travel, how they move around, and that's something we'll be delving into um, over, over the, sort of the coming 40 minutes or so. We're a curious bunch, people. You certainly look like a curious bunch, and I mean that in the most respectful way possible. Um, because for as long as at least Homo sapiens have been on the planet, we've longed to know what's ahead of us. You know, indeed, for thousands of years, uh, we've attempted to predict, sometimes control, manage, and understand the future. You know, now for the purpose of what we're going to talk about today, uh, we're going to focus on sort of iterative, exploratory methods. The things that designers, storytellers, creatives like many of you in this, in this room and I'm sure online do. And so that includes backcasts, scenarios and visioning. You know, many futurists use visioning as a method not only to forecast but also to encourage potential futures. It's a little bit like midwifing. You just need a little more of a push, you know? We're trying to bring these things into being. And so visioning often involves creating and describing alternative futures, some which may be preferred. And we'll, we'll come to that idea of preference uh, in, in a little while. You know, as many of you will know, um, making a future happen beyond an idea is not a straightforward process. Um, the big value of doing these kind of things is often in their ability to uncover new ideas. You know, actually through speculation, th there's a prospective element to this. We're looking for something. We're kind of digging for the gold. We're trying to have a revelation or find something. And so through doing that, we can often challenge our existing assumptions about how the future might be, how it might become, and for why. And that's why imagination and creativity are so important. And this is one example of many kind of ideas for future cities, you know. This seminal example by the Italian radical architecture group, Super Studio, they took their, if we think about the means of production, like how they actually made this image, they took a lot of their inspiration from the advertising of the day, and in particular, the use of paint airbrush painted techniques, you know, very slick advertising, which, which sort of, really complements it alloys really well with their critique of a lot of contemporary architecture at the time um, to produce this sort of um, sleek, ubiquitous, yet surprisingly featureless global urban condition as shown here in one of their projects, the Continuous Monument. So this kind of like an anti-architecture of architecture that asserts itself, you know. But just how important can visions be. Perhaps one of the most influential and enduring attempts to imagine how things might become was Futurama, a giant model of an urban future designed by Norman Belgedis, an exhibit in 1939 and 1940 
uh, in the General Motors Highways and Horizons Pavilion at the World's Fair in New York. And presenting a preview of how the city of the future in 1960 would be, uh, people sat on these seats, and you may not be able to appreciate it, but it's actually going round on a very slow-moving conveyor belt. So those seats are moving. And in doing so, the people that visited are, are traveling around above this, this future city, this projected city. The city itself contains skyscrapers, expressways, and automated farms. And for most people, you know, the idea even necessarily of skyscrapers and expressways, this was the first time they saw those things. They were not necessarily part of their daily experience. Um, it was visited by thousands of people over, over the period that it was open, with about 5 million people visiting this exhibit alone. So there was often, you know, a mile sort of queue just to get in this thing. It was so popular, you know, it was this fantastical element. Um, and so its impact in sowing the seeds for the future urban landscape of America was really significant. You know, this, this really infiltrated the public and professional imagination as to how the future of America was going to be. And so I think, as an example, it's really useful because it does remind us, perhaps in a slightly cautionary way, that visible futures are branded this one certainly was, obviously, very explicitly by General Motors. But they're shaped as arguments, you know, and as specific options are promoted, so, you know, king of the highway, we're all going to be on the road. When you do that kind of thing, when you make that kind of statement, when you promote certain values, by very definition, you are discrediting, unintentionally or not, other types of lifestyle and values, and maybe even hiding them out the way. So when you say this is the future, the things that are on the flip side of that are sort of quietly lurking in the background or dismissed. Envisioning future environments has long been an inspiration for architects, artists, and designers. And although many of these visions for future built environments, like all these three here, you can see, um, were never actually built, I mean, maybe as a maquette, maybe as a model, but certainly um, you know, not as a, as a city at the scale that we would recognize it in reality. Um, it doesn't mean that these things are not important. You know, there's been entire generations of architects and urban planners inspired by fictional things as much as real things. And that's really important to knowledge. You know, they, they question reality in different ways, maybe in more interesting ways, possibly, than the way in which um, actual built cities uh, are delivered. So they can often hold considerable influence, you know, over the way we, we think about cities and critically the way the public thinks about future cities and future built environments. So when we're working with all our stakeholders and all those different uh, actors uh, in the mix of trying to affect change, if you're sat there and going, look, you know, this is, this is going to be great. You'll be able to walk to work. You'll be able to drop your kids off. You'll be able to see your mum who's not very well. You're going, Kind of doesn't look like Blade Runner, though, does it? You know, it's a bit disappointed, you know? So, so it's really important to recognize how impactful these things could be, um, even though they may be quite ancient now. So, Left to Right, Visionary City by William Robinson Lee, 1908. This is kind of classic, early, twen early 20th century American optimism. We're going to build the metropolis of the future. We've got, um, you know... It, our built environments are going to be sort of mile-long buildings of hundreds of stories, um, you know, high, connected by gaslit skyways. I'm sure there's no problem with that. Um, for trams, pedestrians, and horse-drawn carriages. You know, metropolis in the middle, meanwhile, um, shows a, a utopian society, at least to begin with, where its wealthy residents live in a carefree world. But, of course, it's not quite like that, and as the narrative unfolds, you know, we, we understand that the inequality of the city, which is evident in many of our actual cities, is manifest in the underground world of the people who, you know, actually working to make sure that this sort of slightly artificial thing above ground um, creates uh, the, that utopian world, you know, it keeps, it keeps functioning. And then, of course, Blade Runner, which, goodness me, is quite old now uh, by, by any measure. 
And yet at the time, you know, the radical reimagining of a future Los Angeles from being a really low density, sprawling city that's generally basking in the Californian sun to suddenly be a highly dense vertical city of rain-drenched towers uh, with, of course, our spinner vehicles, flying cars, big feature of future-built environments, as you'll know, uh, able to navigate you know, this new vertiginous uh, environment was, seemed quite radical. It seemed quite shocking, even though it was borrowing from existing Asian cities, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and was heavily inspired by the director Ridley Scott's childhood in Teesside and looking at the gas works and loads of metal pipes. So a bit mundane, actually, and not perhaps quite as exciting as we might imagine it to be. But that's the reality of it. So this kind of multitude, uh, as Ray was saying in the introduction, of you know climatic, social, economic, and cultural kind of pressures for urban settlements around the world really mean that the way we envision the future has come particularly important. And I would say... It's having a really important moment right now. I think it's a long moment uh, that we can we can invest in and take opportunity. But people are really interested in this. I mean, you're all here, uh, so so um, I'll talk briefly about this. Uh, this is not a lecture about future studies or future methods, but I think it's worth it because uh, just going through this a little bit. Some of you may be familiar. I apologise if you're all familiar with this, but. Joseph Veros recognized the possibility for kind of conceptual clarification that could be offered in thinking about the future. And he, he drew this cone, okay? And if we, if we think about the future as kind of extending, as, a, as, as, as an imaginary horizontal line running all the way through that, the middle of that cone, sort of that's like, if we just stay exactly as we are now in the world, that's where we're headed, okay? And then... He says, well, okay, but if we start to think differently about the future, as we move further away from that imaginary central line, then really what you've got is different subdivisions of progressively larger options. So we've got what is still very likely to happen, the probable future. We've got what could happen, the plausible future, and then it's kind of anything goes. Well, it's possible. I mean, it probably isn't going to happen, but we, we, we don't know. You know, and he, he created this, uh, uh, you know, uh, monomic device, you know, with these probables and plausible and possible. But I'm really interested in the last cone, you know, that we can see here. The preferable. What does that mean? Preferable for whom and who decides? Or to think about it another way. In whose image is the future built environment to be made, reshaped, or transformed? And I want to make it clear, I'm showing this so we can talk about preferable futures later and hopefully have some good questions and conversations about that. There's been lots of criticisms of this. You know, a couple of obvious ones. It assumes that history has no bearing on anything because everything starts from now. I suspect that's probably not the case. And it also assumes that we're good people and we all agree on an accepted point to begin with, which is now. And I suspect, even though you're all here now, some of your nows are very different. Some of you are thinking, this is quite interesting. Some of you are thinking, I'm glad I didn't pay money. Some of you are thinking, this is all right. Might need the toilet in a minute, you know? So all of us in a present now are doing slightly different things. It, so it's not consensual. Future-built environments, as I said earlier, have been speculated and discussed for centuries, you know, as urban areas around the world have been imagined, planned, built, adapted, and studied. And some future visions have been successful, whilst others have perished. And the difficulty of providing even a precise definition of the term future city, which gets all kinds of people hot and bothered sometimes, is reflected in the way it's used ambiguously uh, academics notoriously can't agree on a definition across disciplines. I see it used in very different ways, perhaps by architects, planners, policy makers. Um, so this thing is traveling. And even though we think we're talking about the same thing, there is an issue of translation actually happening where maybe we're not quite talking about the same thing. And it's worth 
understanding those differences and also how we deal and negotiate through differences of opinion. The architect and influential uh, urban planner, uh, Eugene Heder, was uh, arguably the first to publicly discuss future cities during his address to the Royal Institute of British Architects in London in 1910. And uh, he didn't just talk about it, he brought drawings. Of course he did, he's an architect. Um, and he said, look, this is, this is my concept for the, for the future city. It's going to have an artificial brain in the middle, okay? And it's going to control all the organization and management of the urban landscape. Doesn't that sound lovely? Sounds a bit eerily familiar, actually, perhaps, to some things that are going on at the moment. You know, and this idea of a sort of central, operationalized, urban system of systems where everything is knowable, controllable, and manageable has endured. As you saw in the image a couple of slides ago, you know, perhaps most evocatively, that idea of the mechanized, controllable city is best represented in cinema through Fritz Lang's Metropolis. But also, though usually much less iconic in architectural terms than Metropolis, it's often the principal idea behind many smart city initiatives. And this kind of idea of enclosing human activity in cities is not a new one. Of course, it has its origins in earliest forms of cities that had to be defensible. You know, we needed to keep them out, whoever them were, and we needed to keep us in. Um, and this has also carried on over time, but for different reasons. It's not always been about, uh, you know, um, keeping other people out. And so, for example, um, rather than viewing nature as an obstacle to urban progress, concerns, particularly in the, in the mid and later 20th century, about the need for harmony between the built environment and the natural environment became increasingly urgent as the effects of human societies on the planet really started to enter sort of collective knowledge and awareness. You know, so we get significant environmental movements, whole earth catalogue, you know, we begin to think, actually, this is not great. And this example is an interesting take on that. I think you'll agree. This is um, by Luigi Pellegrin. It's a member of the Association for Organic Architecture, created by Bruno Zevi in 1945. And it was driven by a quest for an eco-urbanism that would redefine the boundaries between the artificial and natural environment. And the vision, I mean, there's lots of drawings, paintings produced for this, but it's perhaps most powerfully shown in uh, his Vector Habitat scheme of 1970, in which his research on how the artificial should relate with the planet is articulated as a vast infrastructural ring that goes all the way around the globe. Um, does it span oceans? Yes, it does. Does it pass through mountains? Yes, it does. Does it keep everybody in the world in a hermetically sealed tube? Yes, it does. Um, I mean, that's one way of dealing with things, I suppose. Um, um, and joking aside, I mean, there were some real attempts to try and do it, but there's quite an interesting message going on here, which was not part of the original de conceptual intent, which is basically human beings are really messing the planet up. Probably best thing if we just seal ourselves off and let it get on with it, because as we generally know, the Earth tends to flourish much better when we're not part of it, you know. Um, now... Cities, cities, cities. We know since the publication of a United Nations report in 2007, we're always being reminded that the future will be urban. And then the later report in 2018 said, well, not only is the future urban, you know, that tipping point of more people living in urban settlements than we noticed in 2007. But we think, you know, now we're in 2018, we think that, but you know, by 2050, more than two thirds of us will be living in urban areas. Now, the coronavirus pandemic destabilized some of the long-held ideas we had about what a city is and perhaps who it's for. It showed that when pressed, we can actually radically rethink how we organize ourselves, how we enact behavioral change at national, international, and even global levels when we need to. 
And when faced with the potential impacts of climate change, I think this is really good to know. I mean, it, we can actually do this, right? We've done it, we did it, um, we can do it again. But it's also been a bit surprising, perhaps, maybe even disappointing as to how quickly some of maybe our less positive habits bounced back uh, quite fast after, after we stopped giving each other COVID. Um, and so despite the environmental and health impacts that we know these things result in, we're largely carrying on as we were before, in many cases, maybe not in all. So I think it's clear we need new visions for collective life. Now, in 2014, gosh, 10 years ago, um, I was commissioned by the UK government's Office for Science to write a report on how we'd thought about the future, how we'd envisioned it, and what we might learn from it. And I worked with two of my colleagues, and we examined nearly 1,000 different visions for future-built environments. Um, we tried to understand how they could be classified, how we could make sense of it, you know, rather than just have this huge catalogue of stuff, um, and how they might relate to each other. Um, we told the government we've looked at a thousand of these, and they said, Could, is there like an executive summary? Um, a bit pressed for time, you know? Um, so in the end, you know, for the purpose of the report and being practical, we chose 90 examples that were prominent types to give as large an overview as possible to, to the, all the other stuff that's going on. And we classified the materials surveyed to identify primary elements. So there's, there's two things going on. Uh, here. What we're doing is we're looking at the visions in terms of how they've actually been created. Like literally, were they painted, were they filmed, were they, were they drawings, were they, were they architect blueprints, were they, you know, like what's the media that they're, they're using? And then on the other hand, we're looking at the message. Like what are they really trying to communicate? What are their themes? What are they, what are they promoting? What are they, what are they leaving out? Once we got all that together, we then looked at potential clusters, groupings of visualizations to understand patterns and trends of future built environments. Our initial attempt to visualize this, which you can see on the left, looking at the media used, looking at how you know to produce them, what themes are communicated. As you can see, to be honest, it's about as messy and complex as the city itself. It doesn't, it's not really very easy to make sense of. But if you pull this stuff out into a timeline, and we were asked by the, by the government to look primarily through the 20th century, so that's why this starts 1900 and goes up to 2014 when the report was, was done. You start to see slightly different things. And we identified, and this of course is up for discussion, debate, it, it, it's one way of looking at futures, um, six visual dominant paradigms to be understood as flows throughout the period that we looked at. So we saw these, that they, they, they had connectivity, they recurred over time. Um, so we had regulated cities, their visions that kind of organize and integrate aspects of rural, country, green living. Layered cities, their portrayals that have explicit, multiple, um, but fixed levels, usually associated with different mobilities. So you think about the visionary city that we saw earlier. Flexible cities, they allow for plug-in and kind of changes, but they're still primarily fixed to a context. So bits can move, but the city largely stays as it is. Informal cities were visions that suggest something much more itinerant, temporary situations, Nomadic, walking cities, non-permanent things, ecological cities, as the name suggests, things that are demonstrating clear ecological concerns, renewable energies, you know, uh, low or zero carbon ambitions, and then hybrid cities that are really exploring the blurring between physical place and digital space, and that would include augmented reality and smart cities. Um, so one of the things that we did, and so you know, to, to give you a very quick sort of sense of this. You kind of expect that regulated cities are fairly normal cities that have bits of green in and they kind of carry on. Flexible cities and informal cities are interesting, okay? I think it is no surprise that these largely appear and disappear in the sort of late 50s, but particularly the informal cities in, this in the late 60s and early 70s 
when people are taking drugs, okay? Because people are looking for alternatives to mainstream society. And of course, the drugs wear off. And actually, we don't see many of those things happening in quite the same way. But those alternatives, and then you can kind of see, it's quite interesting here. This is only 10 years ago. Isn't nearly everything's an ecological city, right? Is that true? I suspect not. I mean, when we look at it, there's an awful lot of greenwashing. But of course, everyone's saying, oh, but, but I'm an ecological city, right? I've got the right clothes. This is, how I, this is how you want the future city to be. So we have to be careful about how we interpret some of these things. But, you know, wait a minute, that was 10 years ago, right? Um, what about the future of the future? You know, visions for built environments don't stop. And we were interested in developing a much deeper and comprehensive survey of all the stuff we'd looked. We'd also looked at some others, actually, whilst they were busy printing the report. We looked at about 1,000 more. So we had about two, an archive of about 2,000 future visions for, for different cities. And so we wanted to find different ways of talking about these and, and go into more depth in terms of how do we do it. The big question, hopefully, that we're going to discuss uh, today is kind of how do we widen participation with futures for our built environments? And one example I think is quite interesting, at least you know, to me, is no small plans. Um, I don't know whether anybody's come across this before. Uh, I think it's quite interesting as an example. It's basically a graphic novel that traces the journeys of teenagers in three phases. They move through Chicago's past, present, and future. And the novel follows the neighborhood adventures of these teenagers as they wrestle with designing the city they want, they need, and also they desire. The graphic novel was distributed to 30,000 teenagers across uh, classrooms in Chicago. And I think, okay, that's quite an interesting idea. It's quite new. But actually, it's based on Wacker's manual of 1911, which was by Walter D. Moody, which was a classroom text that was given out to teenagers um, at the earlier part of the 20th century, explaining Daniel Burnham and Edward Bennett's plan of Chicago with a series of drawings and perspectives. So they kind of, this quite interesting idea had a precursor. And I think it's an interesting example of how we might involve future generations in thinking and shaping the built environment they aspire to create, and I would argue, must have a stake in. And so through this kind of work, you know, we, we, we'd finished the report. We were lucky enough to get a, a book contract. Um, we were lucky enough to get a book contract, provided we paid for the copyright permissions for all the images, I think I should say, <laughs> clarify. There's lots of images in this book. Um, but that, that came to that. Um, you can see lots of things online uh, about it. Um, but I've been, through this work, I became fascinated by how people think about the future, and when we, we talk to lots of different people. And like many of you, I'm sure, just trying to open up that debate on futures a little bit by offering different ways in which we might view visions and ideas for future places. And so in this book of you know, 2020 with my colleague, Paul Curtin, we kind of look at three thematic types. We look at technological futures, and they are really driven by the optimism um, you know, uh, of technology, the, the dialogue with expressions, you know, often found in science fiction, but not exclusively so. Social futures that really try to investigate experimental and more experiential visions for future built environments. that are led by an impulse to provide for a new society, or maybe a much more varied one than we really bring into conversations uh, often in our official processes. And then global futures that take account of those visions produced in response to significant impacts of climate change. And so the point here, you know, I'm not against technology, um, clearly not. Um, but it's to tr uh, I don't want us to return to some kind of pre-industrialized age or even further back, you know, we're all sat in our caves um, thinking about uh, why this is helpful for the environment. But it's more about placing em different kinds of emphasis on futures and also making them answerable to the different expectations we have. So when you look through um, visions with different critical lenses, you notice different things about them. Different registers of information come to the fore. 
Um, and so you can actively start to have conversations about social futures and global futures rather than everyone always asking you where the flying cars are going to go, you know, which I think is helpful. Speaking of which, let's consider this example. And uh, uh, this is a, a vision. It's I've, I've, I've chosen it not uh, out of disrespect for this particular project, okay? I think it's just an example. Um, it's for Paris 2050 by Vincent Caliber Architectures. Um, and it's, it's a classic kind of smart city image, okay? Um, it's, it's the kind of thing that was really bouncing around about 10 years ago, still is. These things are still echoing around, I would, I would say, uh, but we can discuss that. And the environment shown in these kind of uh, examples of smart cities always illustrate a gleaming, shimmering world of transparent surfaces and greenery. It's all right, isn't it? But although visually enticing, many of these types of city vision forgo the reality of cities and completely remove the challenges and obstacles of clean energy production. You know, such kind of sterilization in a way of a complete city seems unlikely especially those that already exist, you know, the, the complexities of trying to integrate um, new systems for energy, transport, uh, architectural envelopes within existing conditions that have often been built up in layers, usually over many, many years, is massive. And visions like this are always conspicuously free of debris, dirt and pollution. You know, I would say they're unrealistically manicured. They're always verdant. The sky, the sky is always azure blue. You know, look at it. It's stunning. Um, there's no seasonal change. There's no inclement weather. There's no real sense of what rewilding might actually do and ethical considerations maybe of what a good species or bad species might coexist in a city. And yet we already know this will not happen. We can look at it and we can, we can get excited by it but we kind of know it won't happen. And that's because, you know, in his discussion of the future mundane, Nick Foster suggests that if you start to think about the future as a partly broken space in a positive way, it's helpful. It makes it relatable. It reminds us that, and, you know, quote, it will include taxes, sorry, illness, weather, transport delays, and allergies. Things will break. Things will fail to perform as promised. Things will need fixing. And, you know, therefore, opening up what futures can be is imperative. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, rather than being solved by technology in the smart sense, one outcome is that cities will just carry on. They will continue as they are or they'll be deserted. The cost of change might result in inundated areas simply being abandoned and that's already happened in some cities in, in, the, in the States and elsewhere, um, whilst more privileged areas might be protected. You know, in this example, a Qualta by Clouds Atlas, uh, Clouds Architecture Office, is just one location of a much bigger project. Uh, it's attempting to depict New York in uh, 2109. You know, and rather than, rather than dealing, right, to stop the water, you know, this urban future, sort of says, dwellers just migrate to higher and drier elevations as the water levels gradually increase. Here's boardwalk systems of navigable canals um, re-establish the transportation network lost below. And so residents repurpose rooftops um, for farms, greenhouses. So rather than devising ever more complex technologies in an escalating battle against nature, like we always think there's a technological fix, actually we go, we adapt, we, we allow these things to happen. And so here, this kind of social future is about our relationships and ability to remain connected to one another and live in proximity. That's the thing that matters. Rayta mentioned I love darkness, so I couldn't really not put this in. I hope you don't mind. Um, I think darkness is interesting as, a, as an entirely different subject, and that's a completely different lecture. But it's interesting how it's used in future visions because it's usually dangerous and dystopic, it's problematic, and it, it taps into those very primal fears that many people have about darkness, safety and security at night. Um, but this could be an alternative provocation for a global future, you know? 
To reimagine how our places might be at night, we need compelling visions for the future beyond the usual highly, often overly illuminated metropolis. And this is uh, from the Darkened Cities series by Thierry Cohen. It's a vision of global cities without electricity. Uh, the way he does this, he, he obviously they're manipulated and he takes a photo of uh, a nighttime sky from a similar latitude, but that's not impacted by light pollution. Now, this work was not intended as a vision for a future city. It's, a, it's, it's an art project. And nor am I suggesting, I'm not going to start turning all the lights off now, nor am I suggesting that we do without electricity, but more that something like this can maybe help us rethink maybe some of the vast amounts of energy that a cities waste and the cascading impacts of light pollution that has upon our health and that of other species. We zoom out the city a bit and start to think bigger. Then OMA, AMO's and Europa Eurogrid gave a vision of a connected future city through a Europe-wide strategy of making the most of all uh, reducing carbon emissions. It was, it was attempting to do that by 80%. Uh, by 2050, because the proposal taps into various regions of different renewable energy capabilities and redraws national boundaries. Um, you know, so it's based on these, leading to the formation of new territories. I appreciate it's very small um, for, for you to read. Um, but basically, you've got new territories like geothermia, you've got biomass berg, you've got tidal states, solaria, and four hydrophias. And it's a kind of radical reimagining of the relationships between cooperation and collaboration between cities, between countries, between nations. Um, and it was formed as part of a wider initiative of the European Climate Foundation, Roadmap 2050, a practical guide to a prosperous, low-carbon Europe. They produced three volumes of work for that project, and one was entirely dedicated to the graphic narrative of the project, which I think really emphasizes the importance of how alternative futures are communicated effectively as provocations. Carrying on with the idea of strategic and uh, perhaps more practical applications, how do we deliver future-built environments? In fifth studio Stour City, the enabling state, the proposal initially speculated on how to address the UK's housing crisis. Um, but quickly concluded that a major challenge was a crisis in imagination. We just weren't thinking differently or radically about it. So created as a response to the UK's uh, dismantling of, of state strategic planning and building, coupled with the sale of public utilities, the scheme seeks to provide a new ethical horizon by promoting social justice and creating a cohesive identity through shared public space. And so the enabling state here, it's, it's really about the stuff that we don't see on the image, actually. It's about a change in governance. It's about a change in procurement processes. And that's the stuff that they really worked out. They designed, if you like. This is just an image that gives a sense of how that might play out. Um, but the enabling state establishes an innovative city to draw investment from partnerships to develop the future city through process, catalyzing both top-down and bottom-up. You probably need both in, in a lot of situations between formal and informal economies. And it's conceived at the scale of a district. Um, so the city can organize through a program of green quantitative easing, strategies for environmental and social benefit that are impossible in an atomized society. You know, you've got to bring people together. And so thinking about how you widen participation, in envisioning futures, you know, this raises issues. We need different ways of bringing people into the conversation. And this is quite a nice example to do that. You know, it uses gameplay. Um, and this is UMP's P-Pop City in 2018. And the project invites members of the public to explore their cities uh, by participating in a multiplayer city building game. So P-Pop City consists of more than 500 3D printed game pieces. They're based on buildings from the past, the present, and the future of London's urban morphology. And what happens is, I mean, a quick overview, is player one acts as the administrator. They draw cards um, at random to reveal objectives for the city and peep into the cabinet to instruct player two, who acts as the architect, to follow these instructions using city fragments in different configurations. 
And yes, it's a game. But I think understanding how to engage different people in different ways at different levels to participate in a city that should be a resource for all is really important. So I think it's quite an interesting example. And it's going to be critical to do these kinds of things if we're going to bring about the changes that are inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. So what might this all mean? Um, we redrew the thing uh, uh, some years later. As you can see, um, there's a lot more spread betting at this point. This is only six years after our government report. But you can see that people aren't quite sure which way the future is going to go. So now there's lots of clustering at each of those kind of uh, paradigms occurring. Um, and that just, I think, speaks of genuine uncertainty and, and changing priorities, different ways of talking about the same thing, different narratives. Um, we, can, we can see, uh, you know, social futures are in there, global futures, technological futures, they, but they, they all represented and occur in different ways. Um, we can see also, you know, obviously, as I said earlier, the 20th century was particularly ripe um, for lots of visions. And yet, actually, when we get into the 21st century, it sort of quite evens out. You know, people are sort of not quite sure what's going to happen. And that suggests uh, we've a bit of work to do. Making futures visible requires us to examine the history of future, it, to question its dominant voices, and better understand those that have been marginalized, underrepresented, silenced, or perhaps even unable to speak. And such processes are going to need to become further nuanced if we are going to take account for the many species that need representation in visions for future places. And we're going to have to be vigilant when technological developments enhance our human capacities. We've already seen some of the disruptions that artificial intelligence is, is, is causing in different ways. You know, but that's probably the start of things. It's not the end of things. And when we start to discuss post-human futures with enhanced capabilities, we need to make sure that we're equipped to care for the worlds that we're making. The work I'm currently doing with the team at Imagination is trying to develop more than human design that gives positive expression to the multi-species city. By shifting focus from the dominance of humans, we're kind of important, we're not that important, um, you know, in a typical user-centered approach, we're trying to explore ways that bring the social, the global, and the technological together. And you'll be familiar with the idea of the Internet of Things. Um, so our futures might begin to provide an Internet of land and animals, including us as species, you know, to ensure that we provide suitable habitats, protect ecosystems, and other incentives to keep carbon in the ground. But this also raises sort of an important question, and I'm getting to the end now. How do we visualize that which is not visible? There's lots of models out there. This was done by some colleagues at UCL to think about how you can bring people together, the sort of five model city. There are so many different ways we can talk about cities. Um, and indeed, some of the work I'm sure that many of you are involved in yourselves. You know, to envision futures for built environments, I'd say there's four points to consider. Where we are now, where we want to be, how do we get there, uh, and what are the options? And first, we've got to establish a baseline of what is. And that includes understanding of what is going on in a place and identify what we wish to address. Probably can't do everything at once. Second, you've got to understand the values, needs, and aspirations of people to ensure that any future visions articulate essential perspectives of a built environment that's created for the benefit of people, place, and planet. Our processes for integrating these must enable competing values, needs, and aspirations to be expressed. That's really important. You've got to accept difference, you know, um, and find ways to negotiate it towards shared fundamental principles. You know, for too long, certain power geometries have dominated the way that our cities are built and developed. And so clearly the who in such processes is critical to the level of social inclusion. And we know that the more people that are involved in these processes, that has a direct correlation to who can thrive in the places that we create. Third, leadership and governance are critical in bringing together and implementing future visions. Great to have ideas. They ain't going to get delivered if we don't have that follow through. So that's really important. And some of the work we're looking at, we've 
different governance models, thinking through that, and I know it involves quite a number of you in this room. You know, the strength of professional designers is that they can look holistically at a situation. They can diagnose and identify alternatives and opportunities and then visualize future concepts. And so finally, it's a bit of a plea, I guess I'm speaking from my profession, but you know, the role of designers in, this, in the establishment of future visions is important. We see many, many future visions, particularly for smart cities, being produced by corporations that have particular agendas that are selling you something. It's a product. A city is never a product. It's a process. It carries on. It's dynamic. It unfolds through time. And so design is a process that we can do these things. And, you know, the, the value of these methods, whether they're um, design speculation, design scenarios, world building, storytelling, narrative creation, these are all vital parts of thick descriptions to help us come together and work out what we, what we need for going next. You know, there's lots of toolkits and things for doing this, lots of methods, and you've got to find the right things for the right job. There isn't a one-size thing that fits for everybody. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a ministry for the future, which is quite eloquently described uh, by Kim Stanley Robinson, you know, in detail in his novel. But how do we translate futures into action and commitment? It's apparent that we not only need new visions, I think a lot of them are converging, they're looking very samey, but we also need new design and delivery mechanisms. And in my opinion, of course we can discuss that, um, storytelling and prototyping are key activities, as these set out viable pathways towards the collaboration, cooperation, and coordination needed to enact future-built environments. We need better and alternative narratives to widen participation and mobilize these futures, that midwifing. You know, we can make use of strategies such as policy prototyping and urban acupuncture to see what works, how it works, and why. Is it transferable? Is it not? How can we start to see the edges of these things? You know, the participatory work, the, the reason that I think all of you are here, uh, you know, today, uh, and, and indeed, you know, online, is because there's a lot of care in this. We're interested. We want this to happen. We, ne we need to, to manifest it, you know? And so there's a real appetite for different ways of doing things. Designers and design decision makers, and by which I mean all members of communities, whether professionals, elected, or resident, need to take part in sort of gathering the information, partaking in these processes to undertake, you know, specific contextually related sort of activity. To implement plans, a process of leadership and articulation needs to be in place. You know, you've got to have that, whereby alternative voices are addressed rather than silenced or ignored. Difficult decisions are made, and it is tough sometimes, and trust is established to ensure that the preferred outcome is delivered. This engagement with the political dynamics of a place is not always an easy principle to understand uh, and, and engage with, but it's going to be essential for designers and design decision makers to do. So to conclude then, visions are produced as ways of expressing the not yet. And such imagery, as I hope you've seen this evening, shapes our ideas of and our intentions towards futures, including those of the built environment. Through this process, we can critically question assumptions about what futures are, who they are for, why they are desirable, and how and when they can be brought into being. That's their significance. The time to form them and deliver them is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you for that very interesting and inspiring lecture. We are opening up for Q&A, so please get ready. Um, raise your hand. Introduce yourself as well, very briefly. Um, and I'm going to, while you're thinking, I'm going to ask the first question, okay. which is not really formulated because you were, you've answered so many of my questions already. But one is, I love the futures cone it's and i also agree with a lot of the criticism um and i think something that really came to mind when you were describing and showing all the work that you'd done with historical analyzing and 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 doing the taxonomy of historical visions was that visions are also a process mm -hmm. 
And with the futures cone, it's like there's this end thing. Here's the preferable, even though it's broader and so on. But like, there's like, that's the future, and then we just need to get there. And we know that we never get there right. And do I somehow hear you right that you are, like, how do, how do you work with that notion of like visions are also a process, and there's not like we shouldn't we shouldn't be figuring out that one vision that we want to to create, but there is something in that that we need to be doing more visions and 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 also getting to work obviously in realizing those visions, but but it's not going to be this like let's get the vision done, then we're going to implement it, and then we can chill. Absolutely. No, I think I think that's a very fair question. And, you know, in an earlier version of this, I'd had some case studies. I thought, oh, I'll, I'll show you some things that have really worked. And then I kind of realized how ridiculous that was because what might work in Malmö doesn't necessarily work in Manchester or suddenly doesn't make any sense in Lagos. And so I think sometimes we're in danger of trying to get something that you just implement. You just roll it out. You know, it's a, it, 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 it's a technical solution. You just, we find this thing, we know it works, we'll do this stakeholder mapping thing, and it's great, and everybody feels fuzzy and warm for a bit, and then, and then it happens. And you're absolutely right. Many, many visions for built environments have been absolutely terrible, like dreadful. And some of them were built and led to even more human misery, right? We hopefully learn from this and creating these things. And that's why some of the ones that are fictional, if you like, are really interesting because the storytelling that's happening, the narrative that exploring is, is without consequence to actual human life, I would hope in most cases. Uh, in the case of a writer, I know some of them, it's quite an intense process. Um, but, you, but actually creating the vision is a really useful way of people, groups, different arrangements of communities, thinking through things as an activity in its, in its own right, not as a, as a way of identifying a destination, but actually finding ways that things that are consensual, things that are absolutely not. And so it is iterative, you know, you, it needs to be repeated. It's a cycle, you go through it, you collaborate, you might do it on your own sometimes, but it is a really important thing that's not, there's a real danger that, you get in this mindset of like, well, that's A, that's B, and how do we get there? And mm. actually, much of what visions do is tell you what not to do by, by doing things in a different way, you know? Mm. So it's not, it's not a hard science in that way, I don't think. No, thank you. We have a few questions in the back. Frida, Great. will you? You will run the mic for us. Thank you. Hi Nick, thanks for that. It's really interesting to to hear you um sort of outline how to think better, frankly, and how to plan better. Question from London, if you like, where the political sphere is rather challenging, and ultimately it's political decisions that actually guide development, stymie development, or accelerate development if you've got the right contacts. Unfortunately, sorry to say, <laughs> um, but what? recommendations do you have for taking those particular stakeholders on the journey? And we, we've had thoughts of everything from extending the political cycle mm -hmm. so that people can feel as if they're more invested in the future to dragging people kicking and screaming into these sorts of seminars. But what other ideas are there out there that we can start to put in place? I think that's a great question. And uh, obviously, I'm from the UK myself. I mean, it, it can be immensely frustrating. That I think you need a longer view and you actually need something that extends beyond party political broadcasting in cycles, you know, because you can't have a situation as, as we do, other countries do indeed, where, oh, well, they're out now, so that's all rubbish, by the way, and it's problematic and we're not going to build it because it's wedded to a particular party ideal or, or a notion of it. I mean, when you think about some of the longer standing things that, that have been successful, you know, in London, I'm thinking like the Crossrail and things like that, you know, you, you, you when you're building infrastructure, you're probably building it for about 100 years. You know, you, 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 these, these, this is not a four year political turmoil uh, or, or longer. So I think we do need to think about um, the places we live in the long view and as more fundamental to society beyond whatever esoteric mess or ego is happening sort of on a political platform. But that's hard because 
as our as our system at least is currently constituted, you need that political will to get behind it. You know, um, when um, when the Foresight uh, Future Cities project was up and running, they gathered lots and lots of evidence. You know, um, but when the sort of main recommendations were that really you need to think about people and the environment more, that was felt to be out of step with what the incumbent government was vision was. So they were like, that's great, thank you. And it got put in a drawer metaphorically, you know. So so it needs to be you're absolutely right. I think it needs to be longer. It needs it needs to be it needs to be longer, but it also needs to be agile. And I hope that doesn't sound like a an oxymoron, because you need to be able to do things quickly sometimes too. Um, so we we probably need better ways that are not entirely um, beholden to the political system, so that you can deliver things in in the long term. And cities are long term things, you know. Yeah. Does that help? Thank you, Gustav. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for a great lecture. Um, I, I, it, I just feel like um, w we've touched on preferred futures and we've touched on uh, the power of stories and, and um, the, um, I guess the examples you have brought up have been um, uh, semi-dystopian. <laughs> um, and when I can see the value of, of uh, when uh, predict or uh, producing uh, preferable futures that you sort of uh, take the uh, take the liberty of, of not delving too much into dystopia <laughs> uh, but there's also I, I suppose a potential value in contrasting utopia with dystopia and I was just interested in hearing your thoughts on on that as a uh, uh, yeah in general <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a really fair observation I think I probably suppressed my inner goth this evening because <laughs> um, you're all looking for a positive way out of this mess that we call the 21st century. Um, there's some there's some dark stuff in here. You'd be pleased to know. Um, and in fact, my my other life is all about darkness. Um, and then thinking about it, I mean, those narratives. Th I suppose the thing is, when everything works quite well, which you know, it's incredibly boring. You know, there's all kinds of pushbacks on the smart city, you know, and do we need a dumb city or uh, something else, you know? There's been great stories written about the notion of a wise city. And this comes back to values, because when you speak to different people in a city, the things that they may extol as virtues, the things that they really think are enriching for the city might be someone else's nightmare. So I think it's really difficult to say, well, this is great, this is an ideal city. I mean, there's probably some basic human rights, you know? People should be able to drink clean water, go to the toilet, have safety and security of accommodation, you know, be able to get around uh, unencumbered and not uh, be subject to lots of pollution. But after that, I think it becomes much more nuanced. And I think you can learn a lot from some of the darker narratives, which have, you know, um, critiqued existing political systems or ideas of suppression or whatever, th whatever they may be. And some of that literature and those films are very exciting for the way they share certain things about how things could be as much as, as, much as the good stuff. But in any city, you're usually getting a diversity of people that those values rub against each other, you know. And even when we, we did some work um, a few years ago, a project called Livable Cities, and we asked people what their aspirations were. And a lot of people's aspirations were very much, well, you know, I'd, I'd like a bigger home. Um, I'd want another car. Um, I'd, uh, I'd like to do this, I'd like to do that. And say, um, and and so, so we said, well, how do you feel about climate change? Oh, yeah, well, that's a really bad thing. And yet everything that they suggested they wanted at the time were things that were probably going to contribute to that. And that's no criticism of of those people and what they were saying. They were just answering honestly to questions. But that thing about I ideas and ideals and how you nudge them to affect behavior change and have the kind of collective effervescence of what makes a city work, which is we do bump into each other and we sometimes literally bump into each other. You need difference, you need diversity because that's what gives things an urban buzz. You know, I might not like some of the things other people are doing in cities, that doesn't matter, that's okay. 
you know, and they might not like what I'm doing. And you need those things. So I'm always slightly skeptical when things get smoothed out, you know, in, 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 this, in this very clean way. And some of those visions that do that, I think some of the, the more dystopic things are more interesting in a way. And that's why they form the backdrop of so many fictional narratives, because stuff gets interesting when shit goes down. You know, it's like it's that's that's when, it, when everything's just kind of nice. It's a bit like the Truman Show. You know, that's kind of what smart cities look like. It's kind of weird. And I don't think it would work. And if we all were subject to a singularity, that would probably be terrifying, actually, in a very different way um, than maybe being chased down because you're a replicant. But I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Questions also in the back. Yes. Thank Hi. you, Nick. Very inspiring. Thank and you. I'm really happy also that you um, embrace complexity and mess and nuance in, in, this, uh, in these visions. And also relating to the previous question, I'm, I'm curious because there's a lot of um, prominent thinkers today that say that the dominant narratives either talk about techno-optimism, like from the industry, or the dystopian that is more common in culture. And the problem with those is that both of them make people ignorant. If you know everything is fixed with tech, you don't need to do anything. And if everything fucks up, you don't, <laughs> it's no meaning to do anything. So I'm really curious on visions, narratives that can mobilize engagement. And have you seen some of that in this big study? Or is the majority still techno-optimistic? They, they, they tend to go one way or another. Um, but there are some quite benign, quite benevolent ones, actually. Uh, you know, I mean, the... It maybe wasn't the best image to show of it, but the Stour City example is way more interesting than that image shows because it, it, it does a lot of it innovative things, but it's not wearing that as like the main driver for how it's developing a future place. You know, it's doing things with <coughs> housing policy and, and governance and, 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 and inclusivity mechanisms that drive a different way of doing urbanism. Um, but this is not the the sexy stuff, if you like, that, that people look at and go, oh, wow, you know. And actually, it's, the, it's, it's, probably, it's where the work is. It's where the more important work is in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the, the technological thing, I mean, we keep thinking, it uh, feels like time's running out a bit, that technology will always be the answer, you know. Um, but I'm, I'm minded of... Uh, the way said, you know, the British architect Cedric Price, uh, the title of his lecture in 1966 was "Technology is the answer," but what was the question? And that's kind of the place we find ourselves, and we just keep throwing it at it. Um, but a lot of the visions do go one way or the other. They're either clean, green, smart machines, um, or they're terrible dystopic hellscapes where we're eking out a living underground, like June or something. And uh, there are positive things going forward. I think it's quite hard to capture all that in a, an image. I think you can do it in, sub in, a, in a sequence of images. I think you can do it in film. I think you can definitely do it in, in writing. Um, you, can, you, know, you can do it in graphic novels, and the No Small Plans project is interesting for the way it, the way it does that. Um, but I think maybe as very visually driven beings, we, we, want the, we can get a lot from an image, but it, it, those images really have to work hard to convey sort of the complexities. And I, I'm not sure a lot of them do, actually. They tend to be quite shorthand for, for other things. Thank you. We have time for a final question. That is over to Paul over here. Uh, hi, Nick. Um, Oh. I just wanted, you know, so this and this, this is not a critique of your talk, but more generally a, a critique of the category of images that you're looking at, uh, and the the kind of ghost at the feast of all urban futures is, you know, what happened to the urban hinterland, right? Mm -hmm. Because you know the, the you know the ghost at the feast, it's like, well, you know, that that city's going to have to feed itself somehow, and you know, you know, vertical farms will take care of that or whatever. But that that kind of um, at the risk of putting it in very Marxian terms, the metabolic rift mm -hmm. implicit in all city <laughs> images, right? But uh, you've kind of partly answered this in your in your last answer. But that how how do we get the hinterland back into that image of the future city? Mm. I think it's a great question, and I think 
a lot of a lot of visions ignore it. I mean, if they don't physically put things under a dome, like Buckminster Fuller did with Midtown Manhattan, you know, they, 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 there is a sense of enclosure and not worrying about all that stuff that uh, Carolyn Steele talked about in Hungry mm. City. You know, that kind of idea of actually, and so some, of the, some of the things we're looking at, I haven't got the answer. If I had, probably would be a different conversation, but some of the things we're looking at when we talk about multi-species cities is exactly that. It's not this weird relationship with, with nature, but it's a very odd form of nature. You know, in the UK, we plant trees that are non-native to deliberately make sure that they don't attract pollinators and therefore are maintenance-free as much as they can be. We do, we, we're kinky. We do weird <laughs> things in <laughs> cities with nature because we bend it to our will. And we need to rethink that relationship, which involves food, it involves productive landscapes, um, but it also involves how, how we relate to to others and have different types of coexistences. You know, we might not be quite ready for bears running through, you know, the plaza, but that that thing about what a city is, and I think I think, you know, back to some of those very famous maps of ancient Rome where you saw how where all the food came from, you know, again anchovies from here and these things from here, you know, right the way across Europe and beyond. And cities are like that. They're very greedy things, but it it's not discussed in a lot of this. You know, it's mm. just assumed that this stuff will arrive either in its last mile white van or whatever it might be, or its drone perhaps, you know, or whatever, what, whatever or maybe we just think about it and it appears. And I think those, those practicalities of how we actually feed ourselves and, and live um, need to be more in these things. And they don't, they don't consider it, you know. I think it's a big absence. Um, and Thank you. Thank you so much. Point. Thank you so much. We don't unfortunately have time for more questions. We are closing, um, but Nick, you will be staying here for a little while yeah. for, for conversation. I'm just going to, to close. Um, um, let's give Nick a, a big round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for... Thank you so much for joining us and, and, and sharing your, your perspectives and experiences and research. Uh, very, very interesting and very, very useful also for, I'm sure for all of, all of your work, also the teams who are here uh, creating visions for the, for the future built environment in, in Sweden, uh, taking notes and learning. And, um, and for that, I wanted to just to give you a little hint on what's coming up. We have another lecture in exactly two weeks with Deb Chakra, who was a speaker at the conference two years ago. Um, she will give a lecture. She's a professor of engineering um, and comes to also an author of a book called How Infrastructure Works Inside the Systems That Shape Our World. And she's going to talk about rethinking our relationship with with matter and energy and how can we use the ethics of, of care in the way that we design and maintain our infrastructures and, and that way our built environments as well. And it's going to be the similar thing both online and, and here in Malmö. So do, if you have the possibility, join us in the room. But if not, then, then you're welcome to join over here. And then some goodies coming up in January um, where there will be some visions that are not going to be what you described, I think, shiny, um, a, a shiny, functioning, uh, smooth, um, no humans, um, no no glitches, um, nor dystopian, but somewhere, somewhere there, something real, something for for the built environment sector and those of those of you working and all of us impacted by um, by by the built environment, which is all of us, to join us in um, in visiting and experiencing those visions and getting inspired by them and maybe provoked by them and, and, and get something to work with going forward. So, so jolt that down in your calendar and hope to see you at the Forum and Design Center next year. Um, have a lovely evening. Stay for some conversations and when the time is right, we will carry on into the night, right? Thank you.